You know, when someone works, which you experience firsthand uh, in any place, your life is your job. Mm -hmm. Do you love your job? I do. I wouldn't stay in this job if I didn't love it. I think I would not be in the corporate world if it wasn't Nasma. I'd be like, I don't know, a writer or something. <laughs> it's amazing what you can accomplish when you're into something, when your heart's in it, because you can't fake that at all. Besides passion, when assembling a team, what is it you look for in people? I work best with people who are self-directed, people who know what's required of them or who basically get a clear direction, but high level, and then just run with it. Do you and your brother feel that you are continuing to build your father's dream based on the seed that he planted? Nur, are you ready? I am ready. Another glance at the mirror or <laughs> be good to go? I don't know. I always mess around in my parha. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks for coming on the show, Noura. Uh, we are episode 64 here on the Mo Show podcast. Um, you kind of are a, a jack of all trades. You you do many things. I feel like you're a Swiss army knife of the company that you work in, mashallah. I feel like the family uh, goes to you for, for many various things that they need your help on. Um, thank you for making time for the show. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, it's so I'm really happy to be here. You don't say no to the Mo Show, so I'm happy <laughs> to be here, definitely. I would never thought of myself as like a jack of all trades or a Swiss army knife. That's interesting. I always thought of myself as kind of like laser focused, but you're right. Maybe I'm not. To introduce myself, um, I professionally work for my family business, which maybe now is the most obvious uh, choice, <laughs> but it wasn't obvious. Uh, I had no idea that I would actually end up here. And uh, it took me a while, actually, to get to this position. I wanted to, uh, I had different plans. Um, growing up, I never thought of business. Uh, even when I was in college, I studied environmental studies. One day my father came and said, uh, how about you manage our investments? And that came to me like the biggest surprise. Um, I wasn't interested at all. I wanted to be more focused on the community, on um, environmental, you know, environmental protection, uh, kind of like being more involved in social development. And uh, over the course of my short career before NASMA, uh, I learned that the private sector is a huge platform for social change and actually a very effective one because you decide where to put your funding, you decide what projects you want to build, you have the space to do it. And and I found myself eventually at Nasma. Mm. So here I am. Um, yeah. Backstory of Nasma, was it founded by your father? Yes. Nasma was founded at the end of the 70s, early 80s, uh, to serve the needs of the booming economy, the growing and the changing uh, Saudi Arabia at that time. And uh, it's actually an acronym. It stands for National Engineering Services and Marketing, which is where uh, my father uh, planned the business to go. But uh, we've always had diversified interests, and I think it's still part of our DNA to be a diversified business group. And uh, recently, a few years ago, when my father joined the government, um, it transitioned to the second generation. So my brother is the president, and I am the vice president. So now he's completely, he's the mayor of Jeddah. Yes, he is. Um, and he is and not really associated with Nesma. He is the shareholder. Okay. And pretty much that's the extent of it. He provides guidance and advice when we ask him. Uh, but he's fully focused and committed to his role. And my brother is fully focused and committed to his role. So it's, it's really been um, a beautiful, smooth transition. You know, 
what I've noticed in Saudi, speaking of beautiful, smooth transition, is that many family businesses have followed that suit, handed it down to the late 30, early 40 year olds to, to carry the flag, if you will, when 15, 20 years ago, it would have been normal for the CEO to be in his 80s. Yeah, I think it's a mixed bag today, but there are definitely amazing examples of family businesses that I have given the reins to the second generation while they're alive and healthy and uh, able to provide that guidance. I think that's the best way to do it. I also find that when my father um, transitioned out of the role, it gave us this fresh perspective that he could see uh, the company from the outside. And it it guided us in a different way than he was when he was in the business. So I think that really, like I said, is a smooth transition, I think, because he was around to help and guide us. Whereas if this were a sudden, let's just say that I think this is the best way for Nasma that we could have hoped for or imagined and probably even better than we would have able been able to plan. When the person who started this company and has a vision for it is also around to guide where necessary and actually help smoothen that transition. It goes a long way in securing the second generation or you know, potentially even the third generation. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a company with 10,000 employees. More, we're like 30,000. 30,000. Yeah, it's probably one of the reasons why I take my role so seriously and commit to being in this job because these are 30,000 families that we support. I love and that you see it that way because on our phone call you mentioned that. Uh, I just misheard 10 to 30. And I love how you see it as taking care of families. You see them all as a big family. You know, when someone works, which you experience firsthand uh, in any place, your oh. life is your job. So I have a choice to be a beneficiary of this company in terms of the dividends that my family receives and the lifestyle that I gain, or I can ensure that I contribute to this environment. And Nesma is very much based on uh, the values that my father and the founding team that he uh, worked with created. And it's uh, a a culture of family, of uh, connectivity, of taking care of one another of well-being, in addition to, you know, attracting the best and brightest, hopefully, to to make good business results. That requires work. It requires maintenance. When you work for a family business, you need to see that family to feel that connection to the company. So for me, I don't see why I have that luxury of saying, oh, no, really, no, thanks. I don't really want to be part of the responsibility. I was never raised as you know, in our society, for example, the woman who was going to stay at home. I was given all the opportunities, the education, the the nurturing, the guidance, the exposure. So it doesn't really feel like, you know, something that I can opt out of. And having opted in, I really enjoy it. I enjoy that connection with people. I enjoy the opportunity to, you know, see what the best companies are doing and bring those best practices to Nesma, have Nesma be um, a private sector example uh, in Saudi Arabia, and not just you know us looking at the leaders of business and saying, oh wow, look what they have in their company. Look at those, you know, uh, working arrangements or or these innovations. We have that. We have. I have this platform to do it here. And going back to the platform, like I mentioned, I have the private. I have the uh, platform to also do social impact. My father was and remains huge on uh, community building and on providing opportunities for us to impact society in a better way. So these these programs exist and they need someone to nurture them, take care of them, lead them, develop them, grow them. I love it. Do you and your brother feel that you are continuing to build your father's dream based on the seed that he planted? He probably kind of left with the job semi-done or was his vision and dream fulfilled when he left for government? I, I wouldn't. So first of all, my father had a dream, which inshallah yani, is being implemented, which is that he saw my brother and I as working together in kind of like a yin and yang. Okay. You know, he always saw my brother in the business development side and in the, in, the, in the business side and in, in that 
aspect. And for me, I'm sector agnostic. Like I don't care what business we're in. It's about managing the workplace environment, the governance, the structure, the motivation of people. It doesn't matter if we're in shipping or in construction or in aviation. Whereas for Faisal, it's about looking at the business opportunities and seeing which kind of partners we would work with and attracting that. In addition, obviously, to the responsibility for the overall business as president. So I think that part of his dream, inshallah, we're able to fulfill. The second part of this, I think, would be that when my father was in the business, it was also in a growth stage. And then we reached a level of growth that required to be managed. And so now we're in that second stage where we're all on board is that on one hand, we can't uh, say no to new opportunities and new businesses because then the company will you know, eventually just like kind of like die out because it's not relevant anymore. But at the same time, we need to manage what we have and not continuously think about exponential growth. We need to start. And, you know, one of the things was we need to start thinking in a different way, like business plans, you know, legal department, compliance, governance, risk, where we weren't really focused on that in the earlier days with um, my father leading the team. Mm-hmm. It's almost like you beefed up the infrastructure Absolutely. of the company uh, to be on the level to rival the best of them. Without it, without that structure, without that governance, the risks, especially in this changing environment that we're in, and the extra competition, and also, I mean, the way that the government is is working has changed, KPIs, strategies, structure. You have to change the way you work as a business to also match that environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, something I, I took a note of when, when we spoke uh, a few days ago was how And the saying, never let a crisis go to waste. You told me that you and your brother took COVID as an opportunity to renovate the offices. Yes, this is something that my brother led for sure. Um, He wanted uh, the space to be young and hip and and attractive and colorful. And uh, so when everyone was home, um, we started, you know, he started renovating the building floor by floor. So when they came back to work, they were encountering a new space. That's definitely, as you said, not letting a crisis go to waste. We've had quite a few of those, actually. Um, We were called in, for example, by one of our uh, clients saying that they were upping their uh, ethics uh, regulations. And they were doing that also during the pandemic. And so for me, that was, you know, (laughs) it's obviously a cost to the business. But for me, it was music to my ears because this was my chance to up the ethics game in our company and we went with online courses and linking the signature of the code of conduct to people's emails and I mean the whole infrastructure around ethics and so the client uh, started telling other suppliers to uh, contact Nesma or see what we did um, to meet their regulations because we went above and beyond so I think you know you can look at it as a cost you can look at it as an extra thing to comply with or an extra thing to do, or you can take it and and, and embrace it and, and grow it and really make it part of your culture, yeah. which is how I like to think about it. It's foresight. You know, it's at a time when when many people would, and it was it was a horrific moment for many people all over the world. There's no question about that. But at a time when people were shouting, you know, we're all going to die. This is the end of the world. It's it's refreshing to see t- to see someone taking a step back and say, despite it being a very difficult time for all, I'm going to use this time wisely for the betterment of thirty thousand people in some degree. I think we are really fortunate to have experienced the pandemic in Saudi, because the government's leadership in this regard was admirable. It made me and I believe everyone here feel safe, feel taken care of. I felt that they, you know, they were on top of it and therefore it sets that tone. You know, you there's always that leadership tone from the top when you operate within a within a specific context in an environment, wherever that is. It's not only the chairman of the board or the CEO, it's also the leader of the country. Um, and uh, the and the enabling environment that you're part of, so I think that was really phenomenal. Um, do you know how many Do you know how many supermarket shelves were empty across the world? Exactly. More than than were stacked, and we didn't feel that 
at all over here. Right. Uh, free free vaccinations. Absolutely. Whether you are from here, uh, not from here, visiting or illegal. Yeah. That illegal part that that really like. And the clarity of the regulations, mm. I think, you know, um, especially in a time of uncertainty where you hope open, turn on the news and there are so many mixed, ev- mixed information. There's yeah. so much mixed information yeah. about everything. If you just stick to your one source, say, OK, you know, I can't navigate this. I'm not a scientist. I'm not um, someone who's an ex- expert in this field. Let me just trust in what our government is telling us to do yep. and follow that. It provides kind of level of stability and uh, safety and also an operating environment for you to work and continue. Yeah. Yeah. Whether or not crude was trading at minus $15 or not, <laughs> a lot of anxieties in the world, but it just didn't it didn't affect um, decision making. Exactly. And it was a nice place to be during COVID. And, and many of the foreigners that lived here said that they wouldn't rather be anywhere else, especially turn on the news and you see what's happening elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, so well, we were, I'm glad it's over, though. <laughs> I'm glad it's over, too. I'm glad it's over, too. We can also go to Or I hope it's over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, hopefully. hopefully I'm it's. operating like it's over. So am I. So am I. Maybe because we're optimists and, and, and hopefully that'll serve us. Um, for a company like Nesma, what are some of the opportunities that you see in the market uh, over the next couple of years? Well, we're pursuing renewable energy in a major way. Um, there are lots of opportunities for us in construction. These are our, uh, you know, sectors that we are in. Um, Vision 2030 has offered lots of opportunities. And for a company that's diversified, what we need to ensure we do is that we are properly set up to chase these opportunities, uh, whether it's in tourism, whether it's in entertainment, whether it's in construction or or else or otherwise. Speaking of construction, um, is Neom something you guys are involved with? Yes, we have a lot of work in Neom. We're very proud to be partners with Neom, and it's it excites me so to much. See, it uh, excites me so much. A city being built yes. because or not a city. It's a what is it? A state within a state. I think. I thought it was just one state or one city or one attraction, but. You, you know, you hear about Georgina and the images that came from, from that are just unbelievable. The line, uh, oxygen. So there's a little bit of, there's a, it's multifaceted as opposed to just what we thought it would look like. When you say Georgina, that's the skiing resort, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, the mountains. Who knew? I mean, I've lived in this country my whole life, apart from those few years where I went away to study, but I didn't realize that our country was so geographically diverse. Yeah. I think that's been my most enjoyable discovery post Vision 2030 launch, yeah. that there's just so much to do and yes. see mountains and valleys. And it's not just the Red Sea, for example, uh, and the desert. I can see the pull for why international tourists would want to come to Saudi now with, with these projects completed. I can see why they would want to come because it's it's been a secret for as long as we've been alive. No one knew anything about it. Now you're unveiling it and you're saying... Conservative desert kingdom. Yeah, conservative. Um, With what's happening in Al-Ula, the Red Sea project, down south in Sorda, up in Neom. Like, can you imagine, not 2030, because that's still a little, little too soon. I'm thinking 2040, okay? When we're 60. Still youngish, we're good. <laughs> oh, no. Can you imagine the 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 the, the types of nationalities that would come to Saudi all for the very first time. I'm talking Scandinavians, all right, who have been to Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles too many times, but they've never been to the Red Sea and they want to experience those projects. I am definitely a believer in this vision. I feel the energy. I see everyone pursuing it and I can see it happening. I already see the change. Laula is an incredible place. And uh, I want to move there. You do. Mm. I want to, but apparently you, 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 buying land there is difficult. The people who are from there can own. I inquired on purchasing land there. You can rent, but you can't buy. I actually look in, looked into buying a farm and plopping myself there a month out of the year and then rent it out for the other months. Yeah, or you could do a bed and breakfast. Yeah. There's something in the air there that I just love. Not just because it goes, I love cold, and not just because it goes down to three, four degrees centigrade, you know, down to 30 Fahrenheit in the winter, but there's an energy in in the air over there that is, 
it, it really takes your breath away. It is. Especially always the something. night sky is incredible. Have you ever seen stars anywhere in the world like that? When you, I stayed at the Habitas, I think. Habitas. All, all the hotels there are actually like ecotourism, mm-hmm. or eco-friendly and yeah. things like that. So it's a bit dim. So you step out of your hotel room and you're looking at the stars. There's yeah. nothing, you know, camouflaging that. Nothing, yeah. It's gorgeous. RCU are constantly evolving that as well, like with Desert X. Yes. Last year, did you make it? Did yeah, you go there? Desert yeah. X is awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. I can talk, I can go on talking about Al-Ula and forget the next 30 points. Um, <laughs> 30 points. How, <laughs> um, job creation in, in Saudi Arabia. Where do you feel the next opportunities uh, lie? You know, if we were to, because we're going to talk about women in power initiatives and everything that come from there. But what kind of job creations are open to women, would you say, in, 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 the, in the near future? To women? Specifically, yeah. I think they've erased that Never. <laughs> gender divide. Yeah. That's how we've been thinking since the... That's how we thought since, you know, the 70s or 80s, specifically the 80s onwards. What jobs can women do? What jobs can men do? No, well, all jobs men can do, right? But what jobs can women no, do? No, not all jobs right? men can do. There's some we're horrific in, so... Um... No, I mean, like, in terms of the way that the economy was structured, yeah. the jobs were open to men. It was... M- and which jobs can we integrate women into? Mm. And there was that period of our uh, history in the 2000s where the way to bring women into the workforce was to feminize jobs in retail, cashiers. There were... They were government, serious government initiatives. So that was an incredible step forward compared to in the 80s where we were just debating whether women can work, should work, how we would integrate them, what we would do about it. And then we started actually taking, as a, as a government, I mean, the governments are taking initiative to bring women into the workplace. And then now there is no more this discussion of what jobs are women allowed to work in or which jobs can they work in. Now it's, Women can work. And so I wouldn't say that there are opportunities in particular fields for women than others. Uh, I would say that uh, the glass ceiling is being shattered in terms of women joining leadership positions. Obviously, it's we're a long way away. If you look at, for example, women on boards, a Nahda society released a report, and I believe the number of women in boards in Saudi Arabia was like, the percentage was like 0.001% or something shocking. Horrific. Uh, So we have a lot of a long way to go. But I I think the biggest shift is the mindset. And so it's just going to be exponential. Mm -hmm. Small changes and how they can lead to a big impact is a tale as old as time. You know, just empower, give them opportunities and, and, and watch them flourish. When when you were talking about how you know you you liaise a lot with people or you work with people from the UK or or these countries that probably don't know much about Saudi Arabia, are they taken aback a little bit when they know that there is a female in such a high position in the company? Have you ever gotten any feedback uh, from them, or did you feel that they were maybe surprised that a female is holding a position that you're holding? When I went to my training in the UK. Uh, for the institute, with the institute of directors, I was the only woman in my whole class. So they can't talk about a woman in Saudi Arabia where the I was the only woman. <laughs> so I think that uh, kills the discussion does. from the get go. And this is a global issue. Mm-hmm. Women in leadership uh, is a global issue, and we are not meeting the numbers in most places of the world. Mm-hmm. Look at you guys, and you know, leading by example of how things should be uh, in terms of equal opportunities for all. Growing up, my mother, I think that must have been my first indicator that I didn't notice. Well, my mother used to praise Lubna Al-Alayan day and night. And I think she saw, because Lubna Al-Alayan is a strong, successful woman in her family business and mm. way beyond before her time. Way before her time. Uh, that was something that my mother admired a lot, of course, and opened my eyes to uh, early in life, I think she saw that with the company that my father was building and with the education they were bestowing upon myself and my brother, that that could be a path for me. So now looking back, I realize, wow, you know, I did have a role model, which is uh, very difficult uh, to say for most uh, sectors in the society that there was actually a, a female role model 
that did this before us in uh, in the country. She should have a documentary made uh, after her or a movie. She recently came out on a show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Ramadan. Liwan, yeah. It was beautiful. It was great. It was great. Um, her story is interesting enough for someone to play her in like a Netflix original. Seriously. Can really you imagine cool. her stories? Like what she had to go through, the barriers, the resistances. She came up 70s, you know, 70s when it was so male dominant. So male dominant until 2015. <laughs> Maybe 20 And I think but... also, you know, the the challenge of working with family for most people remains a challenge. Um, you know, I think clearly in her case, her father was very supportive. And I'm lucky to have that same environment too, working with my father, working with my brother and having an equal. Actually, in certain companies, I'm working with my cousins and with my uncle as well. Uh, it's uh, my uncles, I should say. It's um, it's a It's a privilege to be able to engage on that level and engage where you know you're treated with respect and your ideas are are welcomed i think that's one of the extra challenges of family business whether you're male or female or you know today or in the future <laughs> those dynamics yeah. it's a big advantage for family businesses when it works yes. and everyone's aligned it's the best thing ever but then unfortunately you hear a lot of stories even in our country it's got to be said where Absolutely. family businesses uh, have caused the most amount of pain for these family members, but when it works, it's um, it's beautiful. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned something about creating a corporate environment that is more attractive to youth. We mentioned that uh, seventy-five percent of Saudis are under the age of twenty-five, which is massive. Uh, and so you look at these future employees or, or let's call them family members of Nesma. How do you present the company in a way where it's attractive to these, you know, 21, 22 year olds who are just graduating? The way employees engage with companies today and coming into the next generation is very different. And I think this is obvious, but it is very different from how employees used to engage with their work in the past. People saw work as a paycheck they saw their commitment to their company as loyalty and as something that was a stamp of honor if they were loyal it also provided stability you know food on the table and perhaps you know some job fulfillment if you were pursuing an interest but today employees and the new generation of employees look to companies with so much more they have so many more expectations because your work is your day your work is your every day except for your weekend and maybe even sometimes your weekend and now with you know having your email on your phone and having a phone people expect that you answer at any time there are some companies that are some countries that are actually restricting the employees uh, company's ability to reach out to employees after particularly working hours but which Generally, countries are those? Because I'd like to. I'd like I've to forgotten now, but I remember this news post. We will look it up. It's believable. I can. I can probably Scandinavia or something. I can't remember. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> um, but today, you know, because you're accessible uh, and expect to be engaged, employees have a different view of companies, and they want to align with a larger purpose. I've been engaged with the International Labor Organization for a few years, and their tagline for bringing global uh, employment uh, practices and global rights for employees is the term decent work. Decent work is critical, right? So that you don't abuse workers or engage with them in illegal ways. Decent is super important because it sets the minimum threshold. But this is not what millennials and Gen Zs want. They want meaningful work. Mm -hmm. And meaningful work means that the company that they work with aligns with their personal values. And the company that they work for, work for looks at them as a whole person and allows them flexibility and allows them time with their family and allows them potentially even remote work, flexible work. It's a very different uh, world that we live in. We're currently redesigning uh, our performance management system with a consultant that wrote this four-piece article 
on why our existing performance management system is basically rubbish. And I totally agree. It's an extension of the education system where you take employees and you appraise them at the end of the year and you say, okay, how are you doing? Out of one to 10, how do we evaluate your, you know, um, technical skills from one to 10? It's an exam again. But we need all of our employees. It's not about passing an exam and going to a next level. These employees are going to be with us for a while doing jobs over and over again. And they need to grow. They need to develop. We need to recognize them, appreciate them. So I'm not really sure what the system is going to look like after we're done with this uh, phase. But a redesign is necessary. For example, we're also piloting a mentorship program because it's very important to uh, set the framework for managers. We train on everything, you think about it. We train for technical skills, we train for, um, for example, like if anyone gets into a job, they have to learn about the company, they have to learn about our playbook, right? How we sell or how we this or how we that. But do we actually train them on how we expect them to engage with their teams? We expect that to be common sense. But when you look at retention or attrition and people leaving companies, it's known globally that people quit their manager. They don't quit the company. They quit the person that they work for. So, but we don't really do much to train this person who becomes a manager or even guide them onto what we believe or expect them, how we expect them to engage with their team, right? Again, we think it's common sense. So the way that we're working on that now is um, through programs uh, that turn managers into mentors. Because we believe that that's the way that you transfer culture. That's the way that you nurture talent. That's the way that you, you know, uh, get people to stick around. Do you love your job? I do. You look I forward wouldn't, to it. I wouldn't stay in this job if I didn't love it. I think I would not be in the corporate world if it wasn't Nasma. Mm. I'd be like, I don't know, a writer or something. <laughs> it's amazing what you can accomplish when you're into something, when your heart's in it. Because you can't fake that at all. Absolutely, um, yeah. And just looking at you, how you speak about it, it you like it, it radiate passion. And that's kind of like my measure for when I interview people too for the leadership team. I want people to be passionate about whatever they are bringing to the table. I'm not passionate about accounting, but if I'm hiring an accountant or if I'm hiring a CFO, I want to make sure that this person is passionate and that they love what they do. Because we, the way I look at it is that hopefully we will provide you with a platform for you to be able to do what you do in an enjoyable uh, setting. So if they're not passionate, it brings me down. Besides passion, when assembling a team, what is it you look for in people? I work best with people who are self-directed. People who know what's required of them or who basically get a clear direction, but high level and then just run with it. That's what I look for because I'm, you know, I'm a senior member of the organization, I'm on the board. So I I find it difficult to work with people who are that senior who require a lot of handholding. So this is how I interview today. Whereas before I used to interview people who I felt had room for development and I would be excited for them to learn on the job. And that's really nice too. But for the senior most positions, I really need people who are self-directed, who are basically who are looking for a platform to practice their craft. Yeah. So if I see someone who is passionate about their field and who is technically competent, but also someone who is likable, you know, I mean, these are people we're going to have lunch with. Charisma, a bit of... It's not necessarily charisma in the sense that somebody needs to go up on stage or in the media and talk and attract people. It's someone who, if I bump into them in the company cafeteria, I'll sit and we'll have a nice chat. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things I look for. Mm-hmm. Simple things. I... Yeah. Yeah. You know, do, do they mesh with us? Where do they do they feel like they would want to work with us? It's a bit of a culture on its own. Yeah. Motherhood. Mm. What? <laughs> <laughs> what are, or what was the biggest challenges that you faced? What are the biggest challenges that you faced in entering motherhood? 
people talk about work-life balance. For me, it's not about that. That's not the challenge. The challenge is juggling. When I'm with my kids, I want to be with them all the time. But then to perform at work, I also feel you need to have that clear mind. So for me, that's been the biggest transformation and the biggest challenge is, is to do both. I've thought about being a stay-at-home mom so many times. Not because it's easy to be a stay-at-home mom. It's also really hard. But maybe because I think that I can just focus on one thing. But then I think about the projects I'm working on at work and I say, no, I need to do those projects. Uh, and you know, and then someone gave me advice and said, you know, don't ever think that when your children are older, you will have time to do the things that you wanted to do when they were younger. Because when they're older, you're going to be worrying about them. So that it goes from like a physical uh, practice to an emotional like anxiety kind of situation. So that's been the biggest shift is that suddenly there's this person or there are these two people in my life, my prides and joy, that, you know, I'm responsible for. And at the same time, I'm also responsible to take care of myself and to take care of something outside of them. And separating myself from my children has been really difficult. You know, think of it, they start inside me. You know, I used to take them to my meetings when I was pregnant. They were with me all the time and I could control everything. I was controlling what I ate. I was controlling where I went. I was, you know, where, where I go is where they go. And then, you know... You give birth to these children and you start a sl slow process, but it's very fast of having them become independent of you. And I think that that transition from fully in control to letting go has been really difficult. That's a very um, unlikely then, answer. Then And then, you know, you have to work as if you don't have kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so hard. Many of the answers I get on that is mommy guilt, is being able to, you know, continue to say no, whether they have a meltdown or not, I can't let them have their way. But you saying that, you know, they were in you and then they're literally pieces of your heart running around. No con control to no control yeah. is something every mother goes through. But I've never had that answer before. Yeah, like how much control, right? What can <clears throat> I control? Especially when we were just talking about the world and how the world works and how you believe the world should work. Okay, how much pushing can I do against the world as it is for my children? At some point, you have to let go of certain things, especially maybe maybe it's my personality. I like to control things, I guess. I don't know. Um, but with children, that you get your, your head on with that. For the things that you said were struggles, I was raised by a very, my mother is very, she's a disciplinarian. Mm. She still is. And uh, she, and, and, and for me, it worked. So I have no issue telling my children no or putting boundaries because I really believe that that provides security and safety. I'm talking about my children's age, they're four and two. I think that when you provide boundaries for children and you provide them with, um, a, a, like a routine and they know what's coming next and you kind of like restrict the opportunities and the options and the choices for them, I think it creates safety. I think it creates a sense of security for them. So I'm all about uh, boundaries. I'm not about saying no to everything. I actually will only say no if I really mean no. And I always say that to anyone who's taking care of my children, please, no means no. No doesn't mean maybe. Because if you're going to say yes in the end, then don't say no, yeah. because then children know that, okay, I'm not going to argue with this point, or they can have a meltdown, but it'll end. So for me, motherhood, no, the struggle of motherhood has been really just figuring out this transition from full control to how much, you know, how much control can I have and how do I continue to have a life for myself uh, outside of, of them? Uh, they're always with me, but physically, how do I, you know, continue to pursue something knowing that they're somewhere else and I'm not with them 24 hours a day? Mom guilt, by the way, I've been working so hard on mom guilt and I completely reject mom guilt. Can I tell you why? Please. Okay, what is guilt? Guilt is you do something wrong and then you feel guilty about it and then you say to yourself, okay, what am I going to do about this wrong thing that I did? But with mom guilt, it's 24-7. That is not a state of mind to be in. But 
women have accepted this as part of and parcel of motherhood always. And I can't function like that. It, it paralyzes me. And so I've been digging and researching and reading until I came across the work of Brene Brown. And Brene Brown's work is all about shame. And what she described mom guilt to be is not guilt, it's shame. Society puts motherhood on a pedestal, which motherhood is an amazing thing. You know, you're providing comfort and joy and love to young, vulnerable children. So motherhood is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And society idolizes it. But to a point that I believe is stifling for mothers, because we can't live up to those expectations. And I think the more the world became nuclear family oriented, where it's just the mother and the father and these children in a house together, we've broken those support systems and put more responsibility, especially on the on the mom or the mother. And so anything you do that's not for your children uh, is seen as a, a distraction from where you should be. So that's stifling. And that is really shame. I, if I did something wrong to my child, of course I should feel guilty about it. But how can I live always feeling guilty being away from my kids? I've reversed it. It took me two years, by the way, but I've, I've decided that I, mom guilt has nothing to do with me. I am here with you right now. My children are home and safe. My mom is there. There are housekeepers there. If they need anything, they will be taken care of. And once I'm done with the show and I check my phone, and if there is something la samahallah wrong, I will run there. I will rush. But they are safe. I'm not putting them in, I'm not endangering them by leaving them, you know, at home <laughs> or with my husband or with someone else. I've provided them with the safe environment. Why should I walk around feeling guilty all the time? I can't do it. That's for me, that's why I was like, oh, I can't live like this. So I spent the year, I spent the time, and you know, mom guilt is shaming. And I, I don't prescribe to it. Done. That's some. This uh, is my message to mothers. <laughs> and you know what? It's a good message because I think um, the majority has the guilt. That's why I like the message. Putting yourself first, sometimes taking care of yourself, most of the times really could make you the, the best version of yourself to then be that support to person X or Y. I think the example that they have on airplanes where you have to put your uh, oxygen mask on before you even help Absolutely. a child Absolutely. is really uh, should be taken out of the context yeah. of an airplane too into the real world. And I don't think that it is that much. Yeah. Yeah. It's deeper. It's deep. It resonated with me that line. Right? I picked up on it. it. It's deep. Take care of yourself so you can take care of the rest. And it takes rest. two seconds. Like like I said, yeah. just you're hungry, just go quickly, get yeah. a bite to eat. It will replenish you to go and take care of this child. That's a huge uh, takeaway from this episode, I swear. Disconnecting and de-stressing. How does uh, Noura hmm. disconnect and de-stress? Um, I love to journal with a nice cup of tea in a well-lit environment, maybe with a nice view. Earl Grey. I love Earl Grey, yeah. I discovered it late, but I love it. <laughs> it's my morning, my morning go-to beverage. You're lucky it's that and not something stronger like coffee because I'm addicted. I gotta have a cup or two a day. I never got Meat into coffee. When I wake up, I gotta have a coffee. You never did, huh? Not even your days in brown? No. If my friends went out to coffee, I would have hot chocolate. <laughs> I don't know. I never got into it. I don't know why. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't part of my environment. It's good. Dodge the bullet. So you journal. I do. It helps me to just relieve. I just pick up a pen and I don't know what comes out, but it comes out and then I feel better. You know how many times I told myself I'm going to start journaling and going to start doing yoga and going to start meditating? Yeah, it's really difficult to start something. I think it's difficult to also like try to do it with the intention of maintaining it. You know, you just Two the day things. that you think you're going to journal, just do it then. Yep. Enough talking about it and uh, just 
taking action you're right I've, I've spoken about it way too many times <laughs> it's okay i have an area in my life where i talk about it and never take action <laughs> cooking but i will i will take action tomorrow after this episode i like that i like that and maybe i do <laughs> as well I come back from work and after i hang out with the kids <laughs> i have this notepad and i just scribble things you know in episodes and i've made a few notes here but you know if i can just put a, a bit of what's here on here Two, three minutes a day. Can I give you a tip? Please. It doesn't actually have to be pen and paper. Open your voice recording app. Interesting. Just like talk. Okay. Like a audio diary. Yeah. Yeah. Just get it out. The point is to get it out. Get it out. Especially if you're if you're talking about de-stressing. Mm -hmm. There must be something that's stressing you stressing you out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you wouldn't be de-stressing. Yeah. So So many things. However you get it out. If voice is faster. Send yourself voice notes on WhatsApp. <laughs> it's uh, you. Um, you reminded me of um, something someone told me. Said that if you wanted to respond to someone uh, who upsetted you in any way, and you really want to say what's on your mind, but you can't for for obvious reasons, write it down in that chat box, and then just delete it. You'd feel better. I've done it a few times. I felt better getting it out of here and putting it on there. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. It was never sent, but. I wrote it, I read it, and I liked it. That, I think, is in that category of respond, don't react. Yeah. Because that initial outflow of uh, whatever you wanted to say, that message that you wanted to say, that's your reaction. Once you get it out, then you can ask yourself, do I really want to say that to that person or do I want to respond in a different way? Yeah, yeah. I think being calm and showing poise in every situation possible is is underemphasized in this day and age. Oh, it's so difficult. So difficult. We react and then we realize what we did. But some of the most powerful people I know in my life are those that a bomb can go off not too far away from them and they would you know still be calm and collected and figure out how to stay alive. And people react 10 times worse for something that is 100 times of less impact. That's the world we live in. The most powerful people are those who can remain calm in a crazy situation. Are you up for finishing a few sentences? I'm going to say something okay. and you're going to tell me how you react to it. Okay. Okay. I feel most alive when? When I'm in nature. Hiking, specifically. It does things to the soul. A fear I'd like to conquer. Scuba diving, maybe. Have you been? I got my license. And then I got pregnant and I was so relieved that I didn't have to use my license because I was pregnant and can't scuba dive when you're pregnant. Mm. There's something about using the oxygen tank that really just like... Oh, sure. They say so, the Red Sea is a decent place to... Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why I need to conquer this fear. This is the thing that made me most proud of myself. Hmm. I know you don't like talking about me, me. I don't, but I, I want to think about this. I want to put myself out there a little bit. To be honest with you, I had a moment in, what was it, 2012, where I was at the UN leading an international delegation on the subject of youth unemployment. And I thought that was really cool because I, I did it really well and give, I enjoyed it. Give and a it, speech? Speech? Yeah, part of it was giving multiple speeches, but... Um, it was it was at the International Labor Conference, which has a different kind of approach than the other UN agencies, because you have a delegation from government, a delegation from workers, and a delegation from the private sector. So I was in the private sector category, kind of like the employers category. And they came to me and said, will you lead this international employers organization on this subject? And I had so much fun. And I think a part of me felt like I was doing Model United Nations, but I was actually there. And uh, I think that's really cool. Because that's when right. we were young, um, one of the things that like we all said we would become when we were older is like, you know, one of the dream jobs for women in my class was like, oh, you know, represent Saudi Arabia in the UN or something like that. So to have done it and to have done it calmly and like just... I don't know. I thought it was really cool. <laughs> Were there nerves going into it? Nothing. That's what was so funny is that I just, 
I I fully embraced it. I I saw that there were people supporting me. Um, I really enjoyed working with the team uh, around me. And actually, funnily enough, a couple of months ago, so this was in 2012, so 10 years ago, and uh, a couple of months ago, I was in Riyadh for the Global Entre- Entrepreneurship Congress, and I got a WhatsApp. Um, I was speaking at the conference, so I got a WhatsApp from a guy that was with me at the UN. And he said, Noor, I'm in Riyadh. Like, you know, I'm seeing you on stage. Couldn't believe it. So it was, it was, um, yeah, I think it was like a, a, a dream accomplished kind of thing. It's a, it's a big, it's a big thing that, uh, some, you know, something on the level of, uh, of UN. Did you study law? And sorry, I didn't study law. I studied environmental policy, but I did study policy, environmental oh. policy. But there were times where um, the other team, I mean, not the other team, but it, it does feel like your teams because you're negotiating global contracts, right? So there was a... Um, you're negotiating global standards and recommendations for the world of work. So my counterpart from the workers would get a bit arrogant because, you know, I was young. But the decision of the employers was to put someone young because it was on youth unemployment. So he would get a bit catty. And I would, you know, respond very calmly. And there were times when people were getting angry, uh, getting, getting like anxious around me and they would kind of like, you know, do the thing that old people do to young people, kind of like put their hands on the microphone and I would tap it away. When I think about that now, I'm like, <laughs> I really own that. And then I also like Good was stuff. speaking to them in their different languages. I don't know. I thought that was really Good fun. Good stuff. It, it, yeah, yeah, it's 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 um, it's something definitely to be proud of. And yeah. Don't, don't even... Yeah. I like that moment yeah. in my history. Own, own, own that as you, as you own the microphone. Portion. <laughs> Favorite place in the world to visit? I don't have one. I, oh, actually, I do. <laughs> South America. Khaled and I went for our honeymoon, and we just loved it. I want to keep going back. We started in Ecuador, then went to um, Bolivia, and then went to Chile, and then went back again uh, to Peru. Is it as dangerous as people make it out to be? I mean, maybe there are parts that are dangerous, but we were on a very... Uh, organized uh, uh, experience and it was just so beautiful the culture the nature my mother-in-law used to make fun of us when she'd see the photos because we were on our honeymoon but you know we were hiking all the time so she kept calling it the hunger games <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a honeymoon these are the hunger games it's a nice but part of the world to it. to hike in uh, and we started with snorkeling in the galapagos islands all the way down to hiking and glaciers wow so it was all the seasons all the weather conditions towards chile it turns to glaciers yeah and patagonia Argen- patagonia oh you did Ar- Argent- is that argentina argentina has a patagonia side too okay. but we did the chileans chilean side mm. that's yeah. a continent to discover huh Oof. i would go back so many times mm. beautiful something you wish to accomplish in your lifetime we have a project called Namat, that is a nonprofit uh, focused on creating employment for women in villages through um, garments for social goods, so uniforms. And our vision for that is for this to be replicated across all of the kingdom so that women in villages all across the 13 provinces of Saudi Arabia have access to employment. Because today, employment is coming readily to people in cities, but villages or areas outside of the main economic cities are um, less fortunate to have these opportunities. And my dream is for this project to to reach its full potential. potential. You meet 18-year-old Noura today, and you are allowed to say three words to her. 18-year-old Noura was in college I freshman, loved freshman? college, Noura. I would say three words. Keep it up. I loved college, Noura. Yeah. I went to college so uh, excited for everything that was being offered. Activities, new people. It's and, a nice culture, uh, the Brown culture. Brown is an amazing uh, university, an amazing school. Mm, melting pot. Um, it's... Uh, it, it, it's all about community, which is interesting because 
now in my job, Nasma is all about fostering that culture and that community within the workplace. And um, Brown was that. Uh, people came in from all places and there was zero emphasis on grades. It was em- an emphasis on learning. And so you could take any course and if you were concerned that it would drop your GPA or whatever, you could take it pass fail just so that you could, it would encourage you to take these uh, subjects. But also I think I was hungry for extracurricular activities that I didn't have growing up in Saudi Arabia. I mean, I had some exposure to um, private lessons, but there was this world of opportunity. You could try out radio, you could try out martial arts, you could try out um, African drumming, you could try out uh, languages, you could try out, and guess what? I tried them all. I was nonstop in college. Wow, mashallah. I loved it. Is that a brown thing or an Ivy League thing? I think the universities in the Ivy League are very different from one another. And uh, I'm biased. I like that so many things on offer. Take your pick and see what sticks. Just try everything. You don't try, you'll never know. Yeah, it's a it's a mm-hmm. liberal arts college. So you're ex- expected to study, you know, the there are maybe only engineering is an, a degree that you would need to come into the university knowing you wanted to pursue. Or, for example, pre-med, if you wanted to do that in addition to whatever you were studying. But... Uh, in general, I think most of us went um, with a major undecided. And the way I came across environmental studies was, which is what I majored in, was I just kept asking people for different courses that they were taking and which ones were interesting. And by the time I reached the end of my sophomore year, I checked what I had taken and discovered that that was the closest degree that I would be ready to complete. So I just ended up taking the remaining courses and did it that way. Last one before we uh, say goodbye. Uh, advice to these youngsters entering college now. What's something they, they should focus that will prepare them for the real world? Self-discovery. It's like a term. <clears throat> college, yes, is a time to retain knowledge and acquire the degree that you need that will then open up the workforce for you. But it is really a time to get to know yourself more outside of the parameters of what your friends that you've known from when you were a kid uh, put on you, from what your family expects of you, from what your environment that you were comfortable in uh, made you think you are. It's a chance to go above and beyond that and really discover what drives you, what motivates you, um, what makes you come alive You might end up making the same decision to take that same job that you were, had always planned. But I really think that college is a period of self-discovery. Sorry. And unfortunately, I don't think enough youth um, give it the attention that it deserves. So I think if you know better what makes you um, more productive, what makes you more efficient, what makes you more focused, what makes you more energetic, it'll allow you to apply for jobs that resonate with this more. So I think it's really important yeah. to spend the time getting to know yourself. To know yourself, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Nora, so much. Thank you. For, I really enjoyed uh, this. The talk. Um, a lot of takeaways, a lot of uh, examples of what to do and not to do. Uh, I know we spoke a lot about the corporate world, but we also got a chance to know you and um, what your fears are and uh, what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very fruitful conversation. Is um, did we get did we get everything out of you? Is there something that you feel like we might have missed, or did we squeeze enough out of you? Feeling pretty squeezed. You're feeling pretty squeezed. Okay, <laughs> we'll leave something for the next time you're back. Okay. Uh, I really do appreciate your time and coming on here, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it too. I did. It's always like I said when I talk, I learn so much, and obviously in addition to listening, and I really enjoyed this back and forth mm. chat. Mm. Thank you. Likewise, thank you for sharing everything. And uh, it is uh, always a pleasure catching up and a pleasure to have you on the show. Likewise. All the best. Thanks Thank so much, Noda. Thanks. You too. <clears throat>